Yeah. All right. Well, let us get started this morning. Uh, and welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Um, 85 participants. That's great. I think we'll probably have a few more join in as we get going. Uh, Kelsey, do you want to say any uh, welcome from Warp before we get started? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Judy. Um, and thank you all for being here today. It's wonderful to see that uh, we have people joining from so many different regions and countries. Um, I'm Kelsey Wiskirk and I'm WARP's Executive Director. And I'm just going to uh, briefly share a little bit of information about WARP for anyone who is new um, to joining us for a program. Um, I'm showing you our website, weavarealpeace.org. Uh, WARP is an international textile networking organization. And we have uh, over 500 members living all over the world. And uh, these monthly panel discussions are one of the uh, ongoing programs that we have to help share the stories of um, textile communities. So I want to share first that under the events tab on our homepage, you can find other upcoming free programs and members only programs. And if you're interested in seeing um, events that we've had previously on the previous events tab, you can click there and you can read all about the other programs we've had and also watch all of the video recordings. So I invite you to check out that resource. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about WARP, there's lots of information under our news tab. Um, there are some nice resources under the community tab, including the Artisan Direct Connect is a sort of directory of WARP member businesses um, by category. So if you're interested in finding um, handmade textiles or going on textile tours, um, then please check out that resource. And if you're interested in what a membership with WARP involves, you can find information here on the membership tab. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us today. We're so excited about this program and Judy will introduce today's panelists. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, yes, I'm Judy Jetson. I'm coming to you today from Asheville, North Carolina, which is where I live and work and play. Um, I'm the leader of a nonprofit called Local Cloth. And we connect farmers and artists as a way to grow the fiber economy in our region. Um, I've done economic development in rural areas and around craft for the better part of my working years. And I love to do it so much I get involved with groups like WARP as a volunteer. Um, I'm gonna moderate the program today and for those of you who've been with us before, you know the drill. We'll have the presenters each talk for five to 10 minutes. So we'll have about a 30 minute program and then we'll have questions and answers from you. If you do have questions during the course of the program, write them in the chat. If they're specific, like clarifying questions for what was said, I'll interrupt the speakers so they don't have to watch the chat. Um, but otherwise we'll hold them all till our four speakers are done, and then we'll do the Q&A. Um, I'm pleased to be able to introduce to you uh, staff members and from the Arizona Historical Society, which is the operator of several museums and lots of collections of beautiful textiles from all over the world. Uh, this program that we're gonna talk, there are really two specific collections we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna zoom in on the Migrant Quilt Project and also the COVID Memorial Quilts, which are quite unusual and stimulating projects. Um, but we're also gonna hear from Jace, who's the curator of collections, who will give us an overview of some of the other things they have. And our uh, first speaker is gonna be Rebecca Percival, who is the assistant director and vice president of libraries, collections, and all sorts of other assorted wonderful things at uh, the Arizona Historical Society. Uh, I was with them via a Zoom recording of their rehearsal and was very taken with and, and stimulated by what they were showing us. And it reminded me of some things that I've done in the last 10 years and probably for most of my life, but I don't remember all of them. Uh, you know, I don't know how many of you were involved with the uh, Welcome Home Blanket Project where we knitted squares and made blankets um, during 
some of the, the crazier days of the Trump administration's early years. Um, we also had pussy hats. How many of you have made pussy hats? You know, this is social commentary through fiber arts that lots of us were involved in. And, and I also even was thinking about the um, coral reef crochet project that I was involved in, mostly because I thought it was cool that an artist and a scientist were collaborating um, on an international project, and I wanted to be part of that installation. But uh, there was also the AIDS quilt, which is probably the best known project of this sort, at least in my lifetime. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, know others. But the, what we're going to hear about today are some very contemporary projects by uh, talented contemporary artists. And I'm going to stop yakking and turn it over to Rebecca Percival, who will be our introductory speaker. So take it away, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, and so excited to see so many different uh, people from so many different places. That's so cool for us. Um, so yeah, so my name is Rebecca Percival. I am the um, Vice President of Library Archives and Collections and also um, newly appointed as our Assistant Director. Um, I'm actually coming to you from Central Arizona. Um, so half the team is in uh, the Central Valley Tempe area and the other half of us is in Tucson. So um, just to kind of kick it off, I'm gonna give you guys just a little bit of history to show you where um, the historical society has come from and where we are today. And so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background history about the agency itself. Um, so we can go ahead and start the first slide and I'll, I'll give this quick history here. So the Arizona Historical Society, or we refer to it as AHFs, is Arizona's oldest historical agency. The Arizona Historical Society was established by an act of the first territorial legislature on November 9th, 1864. Uh, the Speaker of the House, Honorable Claude Jones, in his closing com comments to the territorial legislature stated, we have established a historical society to preserve the relics and paint the wonders of the past as well as the events of the mighty present teeming with history. That original historical society dissolved when the territorial capital was moved from Prescott to Tucson. And when that happened, 200 Arizona territorial residents got together at the Palace Hotel in Tucson. And in 1884, they created the Arizona Pioneers Historical Society. Originally only male residents of Arizona or their descendants who came to the territory prior to January 1st, 1870, were able to join the society. The first female member to join the society was in 1920. And it wasn't until 1947 that the bylaws were changed to officially admit women as members. In 1971, the Pioneers Historical Society underwent a reorganization and some expansions and a name change and officially became the Arizona Historical Society, dropping the pioneers and ex expanding membership. In 2014, the state of Arizona passed legislation changing the state board of directors for the Arizona Historical Society from a membership elected to a governor appointed board. So that was a big change for us. And most recently that we're very proud of is in 2021, the Arizona Historical Society was awarded accreditation by the American Alliance of Museums. This is the highest distinction and recognition given out to only about 3% of the museums in the United States. So it's a badge of honor for us. And as we talk today, you can see that we've had a big arc um, and have changed a lot and we continue to grow and collect and uh, move forward with history and in the times. So uh, we can go to the next slide. So this is our logo. We get a lot of questions about this, um, about what does the X mean? So this is the X and it is actually the alchemist symbol for copper. Um, so the Arizona Historical Society, we are. Um, Arizona is the copper state. Um, we have a lot of mining and mining operations and mining history, and all of that is really based around copper. So thus the uh, copper symbol is our, is our logo. And we can go to the next one. So Wall Headquarters is Tucson, um, and that's our Tucson facility there in the bottom left corner. That's the Arizona History Museum, uh, right across the street from the University of Arizona's campus. Um, we do have four main museum locations. We've got that um, location there in Tucson. Uh, in your upper right hand corner, you'll see that's our Tempe building. Um, that's the Arizona Heritage Center. And then we've got two other facilities which are actually historic homes. Um, in the upper left, 
That's the Pioneer Museum in Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, once the uh, Hospital for the Indigent. And then we've got the Sanguinetti House in the lower right-hand corner, which is in Yuma, Arizona, on the border of California. Um, and so that was a former house of a prominent businessman in Yuma, uh, E.F. Sanguinetti. So those are our four, four main museums. So that kind of gives you a sense of how much, um, how many properties we own. All of them have collections in them. Um, just to give you a quick sense of, of what we take care of, um, we have about 2,000 manuscript collections, 50,000 books, over a million photographs, 2,100 oral histories, 30,000 maps. Um, between our four locations, we have about 50,000 objects. So um, that's what we care for at the four museums. And so now I will that was my, my very quick introduction to the Historical Society, just kind of set the stage. And now I will turn it over to our collections manager, Jace, and he's gonna talk a little bit about some of the highlights across those four, four different collections. Hi everyone, um, Judy said my name is Jace Dostal. I'm the um, head of our collections in our Tucson and Yuma branches. Um, so before we have Vanessa and uh, Liz uh, delve deep into some of our larger quilt collections, I thought it would be interesting to get a brief overview of some of the uh, like single quilts that we have. Uh, so this first one here um, was made by Pearl Colvin uh, sometime between 1920 and the mid-1930s. Um, her and her family moved to Arizona um, in the Phoenix area um, in the 1920s, um, following some of the uh, larger immigration groups from the um, Eastern United States. And um, during the Great Depression in the 1930s, they were um, struggling for money like many um, US citizens and could not afford to heat their house. So um, Pearl made quilts for her family. And what I find interesting um, about these quilts is if you look on uh, the right photo there, uh, the backing is all made out of feed bags. Um, so she took whatever material she could find in her home um, and just stitched, uh, stitched them all together to find a way to keep her family alive. Um, I think it's a great example of the perseverance of um, Arizonans, of uh, you no know, Americans, and it's a you no know, different view of the other types of quilts we're going to have um, today. If you want to move on to the next slide, um, so this next quilt is the Arizona Centennial quilt. So Arizona wow. officially became a um, state on February fourteenth, nineteen twelve. Um, so in the few years leading up to um, 2012 uh, for the centennial celebration, quilters across the state came together and um, made a quilt to uh, celebrate uh, the centennial. So the uh, photo on the left side here is uh, the front of the quilt. It features no different scenes uh, from the different regions in Arizona. So you have a lot of uh, mines, you have I uh, know Route 66. Um, now these are all scenes that if you live in Arizona, you would recognize these places. Um, the middle photo here is uh, the back of the quilt. Um, so now it has you know, the Grand Canyon State Arizona's um, slogan, and it has the names of all of the governors from uh, 1912 all the way through 2012. Um, and it also has, it has Arizona's logo and it has uh, the um, sheet music for the song Arizona by Rex Allen Jr., which is Arizona's official second state song, or unofficial second state song. And I saw someone asking the size of the quilt. I do not have the actual dimensions on me right now, but I can tell you it is one of the largest ones we have in our collection. Um, it is, guessing it's about the size of my wingspan so no seven feet wide and maybe four feet tall thanks jace yep and we can move on to the next slide um so the last two quilts i have featured um kind of lead into the next few um uh 
collections that Vanessa and Liz are going to talk about. So the one on the right or left side, sorry, is um, the Red Cross quilt made by the oh, damn uh, Pythion sisters in 1917. So the sisters are a um, fraternal group of women who focus on philanthropic uh, works and a uh, charity. Um, so in 1917, they got together to raise money for the Red Cross uh, to support the soldiers during World War I. Uh, so the idea of this quilt was that each um, individual square here, uh, so each individual cross, um, you could donate anywhere from 25 cents to $25 to have your name um, written on uh, the square. And once they uh, had enough to make the um, quilt itself, they gave all of the proceeds to the Red Cross. Um, and then the one on the right here is uh, titled To Honor Lori Paestua. It was made by a K. Winales of um, Tucson in 2003-2004. Um, uh, um, so Lori Paestua was a uh, member of the Hopi tribe, tribe in uh, Northeastern Arizona and was a member of the US military. In 2003, she became the um, first Native American woman to die in um, active combat serving in the US military and the first um, woman to die in the wars in Iraq. Um, so she has, after her death, uh, Arizonans uh, rallied around her name. She has one of our uh, major mountain peaks is named after her and um, Kay took it upon herself to um, make this quilt to honor her. Jay's mm. quick question. Yeah. Um, these quilts you're showing us, are they hand quilted or machine quilted? Um, a bit of both. So the um, uh, the one for Lori Page was all uh, machine uh, quilted. The one, um, the Red Cross one is a combination. They stitched, um, they stitched all of the individual uh, quilt squares together and then uh, machine stitch the backing onto it. Thank you. Yep. And then we can move on to, I think Vanessa's next. Yes, okay, so I'm Vanessa, I'm curator. Um, I'm located at our Tucson location, so the Arizona History Museum. Um, really quick delving into the Migrant Quilt Project. Um, I'm gonna read this excerpt from the Migrant Quilt uh, website. So the Migrant Quilt Project is a grassroots collaborative effort of artists, quilt makers, and activists who express compassion for migrants from Mexico and Central America who died in Southern Arizona deserts on their way to create better lives for themselves and their families. Uh, materials used in the quilts were collected at migrant layup sites used for rest, shelter on established trails in the Sonoran Desert. So the Migrant Quilt Project is um, obviously separate from AHS itself, um, but in January of 2021, the Migrant Quilt Project became a permanent collection um, of AHS, and we will continue to receive a yearly donation from them until the project's ultimate goal is met, which is a year without a quilt. So a year where they don't have any migrant deaths. Um, migrant Quilt Project was started in 2005 by a woman named Jody Ibsen. Um, it started after she went hiking with other humanitarians and came across one of the abandoned layup sites where she saw cans, water bottles, clothing. Um, and she realized that she could use the textiles that were abandoned at these layup sites to bring attention to the reality of migrant deaths. Um, so she began reaching out to other quilt makers, artists who could join in these efforts. Really what she wanted to do was um, humanize kind of what was going on at the border. Um, mostly, especially here in Arizona, you hear a lot of numbers, um, any of the border states really, you hear mostly numbers of these many migrants came, these many migrants um, seeked asylum. Um, you don't really hear a whole lot about migrant deaths or those numbers. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So while she started in 2005, um, she decided that she needed to go back to the year 2000. And the reason for that is 2000 
um, is when the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office uh, here in Arizona began documenting the names of the deceased migrants. So um, they work closely with the uh, Mexican government as well um, for families who are reporting missing people, who are looking for family members, friends who have gone missing. Um, so as they work together and through different medical records and such is how these individuals are um, identified. Um, so what you'll see here is um, on this quilt in particular, I did a couple close-ups um, with different names and um, the year or the date that they were discovered. Um, so when it comes to these quilts, the quilters or quilter, if it's an individual, they can decide the design, the size, everything. Um, there aren't really any huge parameters when it comes to that, but there are four things that are required for each quilt. So each quilt has to contain um, the, the words Tucson sector. Um, the Tucson sector is the southern um, Arizona southern border from New Mexico to Yuma County. Um, and it has to contain the year. So in this case, this one's the very first quilt, 2000 to 2001. It has to contain either the word unknown for those who haven't been identified or the word desconocido, desconocida, which is unknown in Spanish, um, the name of the individual if they've been identified. And each quilt has to contain the textile pieces that have been found around the migrant trails. Um, each quilter or quilter group, quilting group are given, clo given clothing um, that have been cared for, cleaned, um, and then it's up to the quilter which pieces they want to use. Something that is kind of a tying piece to every single quilt is that you see a lot of jeans. Um, so as you're going through, because those are in the desert, you never know, it's unpredictable. <laughs> so it's either really hot, really cold, jeans, um, if you get wet, obviously get really heavy. So those are a lot of the pieces that we see that are abandoned along the migrant trail. Um, and that's been used in most of the quilts, if I remember correctly. Um, and then if you wanna go to, to the next slide. So with these quilts, as much as I've seen them over the past few years of me um, curating at the museum, I find something new every single time. So as I was going through um, these photos, if you'll see next to Julio's name are some gallon water bottles. And I've seen this quilt hundreds of times. This is the first time I think I've noticed that those are there. So I discover something different every single time I look at these quilts. Um, and then I think you can go to the next one. So this is just kind of a layout of our exhibit right now. Um, Jace, correct me, I think there's a total of 22 quilts right now, 21? Okay. Yeah, um, 21. And then 21. Oh yes, because we're going to get another one, I think this month or next month. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll keep collecting these as they come in. And then for those of you, if you're interested, um, I can send out a link to all of our quilts with the exception of the two newest ones are, um, they're in a digital hub on our website. So below you see kind of that link to our website, but I can send out um, a clickable link for you guys to see that. So that's a very quick overview of it. And um, we will move on to Liz. Hello, um, my name is Liz Cap. I'm the curator here at the Arizona Heritage Center, uh, which serves the uh, greater Phoenix metro area of uh, central Arizona. And I'll talk to you about the COVID Memorial Quilt, which uh, in its essence is very similar to the previous project that we just talked about. Um, and it was created by a seventh grader, um, Madeline Fugate, um, in the early days of the pandemic, because she was upset with how the news was presenting the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations, the number of deaths of the people who were affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and she later explained that they're not numbers. They're people who died and they deserve to be remembered. So thus began the COVID memorial quilt. So she worked with her mother who um, actually worked on the AIDS memorial quilt. Um, and so they took inspiration from that pre previous project and created this living memorial. So if we wanna see on the next slide, um, each square has about 25 uh, pa individual panels and each memorializes different uh, people who have suffered um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And this is an ongoing project. So while it began um, in the early days of the pandemic, um, it still grows and continues today. So on the left side of the screen, you'll see the first panel that was ever created for the COVID Memorial Quilt Project. And highlighted in red is a panel that was sent in from New Zealand by Deborah, um, which memorializes the 21 people who at that time had passed from in the country of New Zealand um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, all the way up to panel 25 um, on the right, it's our newest panel um, that we are displaying here at the Heritage Center. Um, and the highlighted square is someone who passed from the disease uh, just last year, last February. Um, and so each one of these squares measures eight inches by eight inches. Um, and that was purposely chosen um, to incorporate the symbol of infinity into the quilt itself so that each, uh, each life is remembered forever um, and lives on within the uh, panel and within the quilt itself. And uh, we can see on the next slide um, that each square is different from the other. Um, you'll see on the right, some examples of um, loved ones who send in um, loving words and a photograph, and then the COVID-19, uh, the COVID Memorial Quilt Project can use their own machines and come up with their own designs to uh, remember your uh, loved one who has passed. Um, but uh, you'll also see the one on the left um, is made by uh, the family members of the deceased individual. Um, and often many incorporate favorite objects. Um, and here is an example of some favorite shirts of the individual that were sewn in to remember him. Quick question. Mm -hmm. How do the quilters um, find out people to memorialize? How, is the word, how does the word go out? So um, the project uh, began small, but is growing. Um, and if you actually go on to the next slide, um, they have uh, a, a website. And so um, this idea, because it was inspired by the AIDS Memorial Quilt, um, the, the news picked it up that this was a thing to, that was growing um, because we all remember the early days of the pandemic where it was, we were just bombarded with numbers. Um, and so this was a tangible um, physical way to remember for people to process their grief. Um, so they, uh, in the early days, they just reached out um, to this individual asking if they could be a part of this project. Um, and as I said, it ranges from people who are, um, you know, it, sewers and uh, creators of the fiber arts all the way to people who have never picked up a needle, um, but want their loved ones to be a part of this. And uh, it's a growing um, and living memorial. So if you do have someone who passed from the COVID-19 pandemic, either directly or indirectly, um, you can feel free to reach out to them um, so your loved one can um, live on in the project. Thank you. Uh, one more question about this one while I have you, Liz. Uh, is, the, is Madeline still involved with all of this or has there been a large or group of people who've all rallied around it? Are yes. they all in Air, our California or, you know, how, who, who are these quilters? Yes. So it's, uh, it's a group effort. Um, it began with uh, Madeline and her mother, but um, a, a team of volunteers rallied around them. Um, and so it's a, truly a group effort. The newest quilts, um, quilt number 26 and 27, are actually being created in uh, one of the school districts um, in California um, where this project was born. Um, and so they've incorporated it into their curriculum. Um, so it's, it's everyone's on deck and working on it. Okay, thank you. The welcome so, quilts. Who's doing those? I am, which I was All right. gonna say, sounds like you know a little bit about it then, Judy. <laughs> um, so welcome quilts is gonna be one of our newest exhibits that is set to open in mid to late May of this year. 
Um, so what Welcome Quilts is, is it's an accumulation of a few things. So it is based off of an exhibition called The Art of Asylum. Um, Art of Asylum featured artwork um, from children who were asylum seekers that stayed at uh, Casa Lita's Welcome Center here in Tucson. Uh, Casa Litas is a humanitarian aid project committed to providing assistance to asylum seekers uh, from ICE and Border Patrol um, detention into our community. Um, so while children were staying at Casa Litas, um, these children expressed themselves through artwork. Uh, sometimes they would leave the artwork out in the middle of the night so um, people could find it the next day without identifying who the children um, were. Um, and other times, people that worked there were given artwork by children. Um, and then this artwork was ultimately created into an exhibit. Um, drawings that were done were, some were done on fabrics um, and they were later sewn together uh, by a group in Oracle, Arizona called Esperanza Quilters. Um, and Gail Hall, who is actually pictured in here in the red shirt, um, she's one of the quilters for Welcome Quilts. Um, she created the curriculum that was used when um, these quilts were shown in Patagonia, Arizona, which is um, a very close town to the border. Um, and as part of this exhibit, um, these kids who are ages 14 to 18 throughout the schools of Patagonia, they came, they learned, um, and got to see these drawings from children who um, were seeking asylum. Um, and then these four to 18 year olds who live in Patagonia, uh, they were also invited to create messages and drawings of basically just welcoming others um, who were coming over from Mexico and Central America. Um, and they made these into fabric squares that later became the welcome quilts. So these are gonna be shown um, at our Tucson location. So the Arizona History Museum, again, starting in May. And we are very excited about this and continuing this. So. Um, and then I think the next slide is moving on. And Rebecca, did you want to do yeah, this? So this, is, so this is just some contact information. Um, so this is a uh, some people, if they're in town, are going to be in town um, and would like to come see the migrant quilts. They are up until April. Um, and so um, we can uh, you can have those uh, visit. And this was our website. So that was I just wanted to make sure that um, I can also put it in the chat so it's it's a clickable link, um, but uh, for those of you that want to learn more or see other activities or programs that we have going on, um, that's a link to our website. And then the next slide, which we can um, leave up or have you guys write down, um, this is our contact information. So if you guys think of something, um, want to work with us in the future, have ideas, um, these are our contact information. So um, email addresses for all of the speakers here today. A uh, clarifying question, Rebecca. Yes. I think um, someone said that, and you said that the migrant quilts are on display until April, but that little ad that was on the previous slide said it was only through February 28th. It's February 28th. It's February, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> I'm thinking okay. of something else. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably confusing uh, COVID quilts and migrant quilts, yes. Yes, February, my apologies. Gotcha. There you go, thank you, Vanessa, to put the... Uh, Clickable link there in the chat. Yeah. So now, now over to you. Um, if anybody has any questions for any of us. Um, well, let me start off with one, and that'll give everyone else a little chance to ruminate. Um, I'm wondering, um, in addition to hanging the quilts for the mag migrant quilt project, what else have you done to engage the community? in that whole, in the conversation that those those draw. It seems to me that, you know, we're living in a time when migration is still a, a big, hot political topic. And I know you sort of have to tread lightly when you're a publicly funded organization, but uh, the, these are projects that are, um, that, that beg a conversation. I'm wondering what other kind of programming you do around it. So for the Migrant Quilt Project, which has been pretty much a blessing, is people have been reaching out to us. Um, so throughout this past year, I have done in more tours of it than I can actually count um, from quilting groups, from school groups, from just individuals who are coming by the museum. Um, and so 
because the Migrant Corps Project already has a pretty large following, um, it's, a, it's been a lot of word of mouth. Um, so I have kids ages, you know, grade school all the way up through college. And like I said, quilting groups that are coming in to explore this. Um, and we actually participate in something called Smithsonian Day uh, because we're a Smithsonian affiliate um, where we have a free day at um, our museum. Uh, this year was in Tucson, next year we'll be in Tempe um, where we had, I think, just over 400 people in four hours come to the museum to view everything. And like you said, you kind of have to tread lightly with something like this. Um, I have not had one negative comment in the entire year that it's been up, no matter what someone believes. And that's something that I, even when I give tours, I say, I don't care. And it's true. I really don't care if you are left, right, sideways, upside down. I don't care what your beliefs are. The one thing that everybody leaves with, no matter what their beliefs are, is that the quilts are beautiful and the quilts are memorial pieces first and foremost, and that it's bringing attention to something that's happening in the border here in Arizona. And the funny thing is, is that we have a ton of locals who even come to me after and say, I had no idea, or I had no idea these many people, you know, passed away this past year. Because next to each quilt, we also have the quilting group or quilters that made the quilt, the um, number of migrant deaths for that year and obviously the fiscal year that it, that it falls to. So um, nothing but positive comments and thoughts. And it's been quite amazing the outreach it's had on its own in the past year. But other than that, we you know, put it on our website, our social medias, different things like that. And that's pretty much how we get a lot of our people in. Okay, we've got a, several questions in the chat that kind of follow along with questions on the migrant quilts. So let's stay with you for a few minutes. Um, sure. Are these quilts going to travel after February? Yeah. And if so, are they available? You know, can somebody write in that they want to book a book showing in their own museum? Yes, and I will actually let Jace answer that question. Yeah, so currently once the um, our exhibit and uh, six of the quilts are actually going to be traveling to Iowa uh, for a year and spending time in, I think, four different museums throughout the state. Um, but the other what 15 um, are currently just scheduled to go back down into storage. Um, but if anyone is interested in um, displaying them at you no know, one of your quilting shows, museums, uh, whatever. Um, I'm the one to contact. Um, so I know we had my um, uh, email listed, but I'll just drop it in the chat too. Uh, we're, we're always happy to have these quilts on display. Um, so we love the message behind them and just getting the um, getting their stories out there is so important to us. Thank you, Chase. Okay, um, let me go back to a couple of the other questions. One is, um, do you have a way of incorporating local relocated migrants into the exhibit? Have they been involved in helping with quilts or coming to see them? Or is there any way that sort of uh, indigenous communities can participate in this exhibit? I think that's for Vanessa. Did we just lose her? I think we might have lost her. Well, uh -huh. let's um, see if someone else can take some of these other questions. Oh, here's somebody that wants to bring them to Vanderbilt. Yay. Yeah. Yay, David. Yay, Jace. You two guys get together. Okay. Um, uh, so we do have an entire educational department at the Historical Society, and we do work very closely with them. So. Um, our team mainly takes care of the stuff, and then we have another team that really um, does a lot of our um, educational outreach and um, community service work, and so we work very closely with them to do in-classroom teaching, to do field trips, um, bring people to the site. Um, like Vanessa says, we, we try to do as many tabling events or open house events that we can where we expose people to these pieces of cultural history. Um, and then um, to kind of turn it back over to COVID quilts a little bit, um, we were approached by a group um, and uh, now are the host site every year for COVID Memorial Day in Arizona. Um, and so we have a, a moment of silence. 
Um, we have our courtyard open um, and we have people there. Um, we'll have photos up on, um, um, you know, uh, up displayed. And, uh, and it's a chance for people to just um, kind of um, memorialize um, and, you know, lean on each other and um, reminisce about uh, the, the loved ones that have been lost during COVID and, and talk about the impact of COVID on the community. So that, that happens in central Arizona every year now. And that's in the first Monday in March. And we've hmm. been working with um, some of the politicians in Arizona to, to um, claim that as a holiday and make it an official, um, official holiday for Arizona and recognized as National COVID Day or, or Arizona COVID Day. Huh, are you, do you know if any other states are doing that? Are we, we aren't in North Carolina. This is the first I've heard of it. I, I don't know the group that we're working with are are hyper local, but um, I know it's it's gotten national attention, so it might it might follow suit. Interesting. Okay, um, I do have a couple of questions that you may or may not have, but I'll toss them out there. Someone is curious how many migrants died in 2022. Does anyone happen to know this that? This is Vanessa. Uh huh. Sorry, oh. my internet. Of course, everything that can go wrong goes wrong. My internet went out, <laughs> so I'm joining by phone call. Oh boy. Um, um, but I was actually just looking that up um, right before my internet went down. Um, one of the things that we use um, in the Migrant Call Project is uh, we actually have a map uh, that dated to 2019, um, from 1999 to 2019 from Humane Borders, um, and they actually do a fantastic job of um, putting out a yearly map that has the numbers. Uh, the fiscal year for 2022, if I remember correctly, it starts and ends in October, um, and I actually just tried to look it up beforehand, and I know it was a, just over 200 um, migrant deaths for the year of 2022. I don't have the exact number, but if you wanted to look that up, you could go to Humane Borders and um, click uh, check out their maps. And their maps are interactive as well, so you can actually hover over um, different spots on the map where an individual was uh, found, and it will list um, their name if it if they've been identified, um, as well as when they were discovered, um, as well as some other information too. Um, but that is a website that I highly suggest to look into. Okay, I'm going to put a link to Humane Borders in the chat for anyone who's interested in that. I wasn't familiar with that group, so that's good to know. Um, got another question. Um, someone was interested in learning more about the quilt that was used in one of Warp's ads for this program. It had a lot of skulls on it. Do you, I don't remember which one that was from, but I'm guessing it was the migrant project does anybody know was yeah um that one i do know for a fact that is a ooh, i think i just was able to join back progress <laughs> yay okay <laughs> okay you better hang up your phone there you go i did i wanted to make sure it connected before i hung up um so yes that is from the migrant Cult project um i'm trying to remember the exact year um that one i know has been within the past 10 years though yeah i think um, it's the 2015 one vanessa i think okay. so it's the blue jeans with all the skulls and mm -hmm. yeah um yes so 2012 to 2013 that one's crazy that one is one that is a little bit more difficult and i kind of give a warning whenever i give tours um, because this quilt um, underneath, and I wish I could have done a close-up of this one, but um, underneath each of the skulls is, again, the name of the person um, or the word desconocido, desconocida, unknown, but also the way that they perished. So um, you'll see up in that kind of middle-ish top, you see a sun that's sewn over, um, and that is from heat exhaustion, sun exposure, um, sunstroke. Um, and then if you kind of look directly in the middle um, of the quilt, a little bit higher than dead center, you'll see a skull that is colored blue. Um, and that is because um, it is a drowning. Um, and then you see a noose, obviously. Um, and that is someone who died by hanging. You see a lot of guns. Um, 
And then the hammers represent um, someone who's been hit in the head or um, had uh, some sort of head injury. Um, so this one is a difficult one to go through and not one that I ever skip over, but obviously depending on the group that comes in. So if it is younger children, we don't go super in depth about it, but still obviously, you know, they ask questions and, and we'll do what's appropriate for that. But um, this, is, this is one that um, personally me hanging took me a while to kind of keep going back to as, as, we, as I put it up, so. And that one is currently on display. Wow, is that one going to Iowa, Chase? I think so. Again, I'm, I don't remember the exact quote. Um, it's kind of, they kind of like hit each decade. Um, so we have a few from the early uh, 2000s, some from the uh, 2010s, and I think one of the newer ones. Uh, let me ask all of you if you're aware of any um, impact that the, these this exhibit has had. You've had it up for quite a while. Um, either on individuals, on families, in the community. Is there any conclusions you can draw? Um, as far as the impact? Yeah, I mean, has it stimulated conversations that wouldn't have happened otherwise? Has it caused local quilters to do something similar? I mean, you know, just in general, what have you observed um, or okay. heard about? So, as far as um, quilters in general, I've had a few reach out that say they want to be a part of this. Because um, the other thing too is these are quilting groups. Like there's a quilt that we actually have that was made by quilters in New Mexico. Um, so there have been quilters from all over the country who have participated in this. Some who live in New York, some who are from the, you know, other places in the East Coast, the Midwest, um, who have just had a huge impact from this. Um, and then outside of the quilting community, if you will, it has opened up that conversation. Like I said earlier, a lot of people, even here in Arizona, who just said, I, I had no idea, I didn't know. Um, and then Smithsonian Day as well, because we do have a lot of winter visitors um, or people who live here part time in the state of Arizona, um, is them saying, you know, I've heard, but I had I had no idea that this is this is what was really happening or that this is, you know, this was occurring. So it is definitely bringing a different light to people and it's humanizing what's happening. They're not just hearing numbers, they're seeing names, they're, um, you know, seeing ages on some of them too. Um, there is a story that um, Jody shares a lot um, when she's able to give tours of a woman who was trying to join her husband here in Arizona, um, hired a coyote to help her along the way. Um, and she was also six or seven months pregnant. Um, she was told it would only take six hours and about you know a week later, she's still traveling and um, her and her unborn daughter end up perishing. Um, so that's a story that we share as well to kind of just show it's not just you know, whatever idea, preconceived idea people have, um, whether they're reading about it in newspapers, um, articles, or hearing it on the news, it's not just numbers. These are real people who are trying to better their lives, who are trying to join family members, who are trying to, you know, just live better um, and escaping whatever they're trying to escape. So um, not just, and not just men, young men, these are, you, know, you know, women, children, older people. Um, yeah. So you get, you get an image painted, um, you know, in the news of, of these are, you know, men from criminal backgrounds that are, you know, young and, uh, and typically that's not the, the um, type of people that are making these trips. Correct. And uh, we've also had you know, like second, third generation Americans uh, come in and view these quilts who you know, bring up, you know, they hear the stories from their parents, their grandparents about how you know, they crossed the border, whether it was the southern border or trying to just immigrate from you know, Europe, Africa, mm -hmm. um, Asia. The, um, you're going to see the impact of these quilts on their faces and just oh, like yeah. putting it in perspective for them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a group of college students from the U of A come in actually within the 
past few months um, who toured our whole museum, but kind of focused on that exhibit itself. Um, and one of the students actually just kind of broke down in the exhibit and his mom was um, an immigrant from the Philippines. And so he just said, he's like, this transcends everything. This isn't just, you know, uh, dealing with immigrants from Mexico in his eyes. He's like, this tells the story of all people who are trying to migrate, who are trying to find a better life, who are trying to do better for themselves. Um, and he said, as he was looking around, he could see his mom in each of these quilts and was just, you know, beyond himself thinking that this could have been her. Wow. Well, you know, I know that the time has really flown for me. I can't believe I just looked at the timer and it's uh, been an hour that we've been on today with each other. If there's anyone who has a final question, please uh, let us know. This has been a very stimulating um, sort of awakening in some ways conversation. And I think, uh, you know, your lives are going to be different from having been part of showing these quilts, I'm sure, especially you, Vanessa, with all of the tours. Um, all right, so last question is Maggie's, and she says, are there are any of these hung in the locations that receive and help migrants? I mean, well, Tucson's one of those places. Uh, so Tucson is actually a huge... Um, asylum city as well as a, um, a refugee city so for sure that's that's one of those places but they've traveled in more places than I can count Jason would probably have a better idea than I do of where they've been but yeah and they've been all over the country you know um, they've hit east on um, each coast on um, no north south east west they've been pretty much everywhere mm -hmm. yeah and then I will say though this is the first time ever that all 21, now 21 quilts have been put up together um, just because some have been other places or you know incoming quilts, different things like that. So if you are in the Arizona area and wanna come by, they will be up again until February 28th. Very good, thank you so much. I know you'll be getting several inquiries, uh, Jace, about other people that would like to show these quilts. I know we'd like to try to get them to come to Asheville. We've got a Center for Craft that does changing exhibits, and I think that would be perfect. They had the G's Bend quilt several years ago, mm -hmm. and this would be uh, certainly an appropriate follow-up given what's going on in this day and time. Um, so Kelsey is going to be sending out a link to the video recording on Monday for everyone, and it'll also be posted on the WARP website, like it always is under past events. Um, anybody who is interested, or if you think you know someone who'd be interested, feel free to send them a link, because this is all about sharing um, this fabulous work that's being done, and congratulations to the Arizona Historical Society for taking on these, um, possibly controversial and challenging subjects and really um, sharing them not only with your own community, but with us through being part of this presentation. Kelsey, do you have anything else to say? Um, I'll just uh, say thank you again to Rebecca, Liz, Jace, and Vanessa um, for the time that you put into this. And, um, and as Judy said, for sharing these really important projects with us, we so appreciate it. Um, and um, uh, lastly, I'll just share that next month, our panel discussion will be on Saturday, February 18th, and we will be hosting the Española Valley Fiber Arts Center, and they will be discussing Churro Sheep Week, which is happening this year in March. Um, so the, the registration for the February program will also be in the email we send on Monday. They're going to be talking about what kind of sheep week? Churro sheep. The churro oh, sheep. Churro. A, um, event in March around the around churro sheep and the kind of churro sheep processing community in New Mexico. So they'll be discussing that event and the impact of the churro sheep in the community. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, thank oh, you someone wants to know if they signed up for this one, will they be notified of future Zoom events? Yes, yes you will. You're on our mailing list until you ask to be removed, Janie, and everybody else.
<laughs> okay. Bye for now. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. So cool that we had so many different participants from all over the world. It was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for spending a Saturday with us. Yeah.